This is Mr. Nesbitt of Harlow, Newtown. Mr. Nesbitt, will you stand up, please? Mr. Nesbitt has learnt the first lesson of not being seen, not to stand up. However, he has chosen a very obvious piece of cover. <laughs> So I just got back from seeing The Invisible Man, and if you're new to this channel, my reviews are spoiler free. This is a hard movie to talk about without spoiling, but that's fine, I enjoy the challenge. But I'm also going to ask you that if you're leaving comments in the comment section to either not spoil the movie, or please post huge spoiler tags so that you don't spoil it for people that haven't seen it yet. Thank you very much. As always, I value your opinions. Okay then, now that we got that out of the way, enough of that, moving on. Alrighty then. Let's start by having me subvert your expectations. And that little annoyed look to her, Mark. <laughs> Great, I got it. <laughs> and tell you first that in a span of two days, I've finally seen two horror movies that don't suck. Bitch, are you for real? The first one is Color Out of Space, directed by Richard Stanley and starring Nicolas Cage. And you're damn skippy I'm going to review that one, even though I had to stalk it down. The color. And of course I also enjoyed this one. Nice. Yes, yes, the, the shitty, shitty 2020, 2020 horror movie curse is, is finally over. So before I score this movie, let me tell you my expectations going in and give you reasons why you should get off your ass and go see this movie over the weekend. Those that know me closer know that I went in with heightened expectations for this movie. Even though I often complain about movie remakes, I'm always happy when the powers that be at least offer a fresh take on an old property. The Invisible Man was originally written by H.G. Wells and published in 1897 in Pearson's Weekly. H.G. Wells wrote War of the Worlds, and the island of Dr. Moreau. His field is biology, which is why his science fiction was written so well. His approach is not so much about how things happen, but more cautionary tales about what if it happened and why we shouldn't. The 1933 film directed by James Whale, starring Claude Rains, is a timeless classic, and along with Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, it is one of my favorite movies in the Universal lineup. In this film, a scientist named Jack Griffin invents a chemical that can turn him invisible. However, he is unable to reverse the process, and the side effect is him being driven to madness. It's honestly a perfect timeless classic of a movie, and I think you should go check it out. You're crazy to know who I am, aren't you? All right, I'll show you. There's a souvenir for you. And one for you. I'll show you who I am and what I am. <laughs> How do you like that, eh? Subsequent sequels and reboots over the years have made The Invisible Man a hero or a source of comedy. Most of them have mixed reception. In 2000, Paul Verhoeven, the director of Robocop and Starship Troopers, did his own version called Hollow Man. I went into that one with huge expectations and left that film both disgusted and disappointed. It was over-reliant on early CG, which was being exploited to death at the time. And I found most of the characters in that film to be quite despicable, which gave me no reason to give a single shit about what happened to anyone. Here endeth the history lesson. Boring! I've always been fascinated by the concept of invisibility, and I've always told friends that if I could have one superpower, it would be that. Would I use it for good or bad? Honestly, I don't know. But that's always been my fascination about the power. The what if. So now it's been 20 years, and as I mentioned before, I like the trailer for this movie. You can't help me.
and despite how much I like to rip on Blumhouse, I am reminded that sometimes in the right hands, a limited budget can force you to make a good movie. This one I can classify as both horror, science fiction, and psychological thriller. This version was helmed by Australian director Lei Wanel, who has only directed about four films including this one, but one of them was 2018's Upgrade which turned quite a few heads and got people talking. After seeing this movie, I can confirm that this guy put an incredible amount of effort into the screenplay, which is heavy on show don't tell. That means it avoids insane amount of horror movie tr cliches, such as exposition, over explaining things to the audience by using bullshit science, and what I now call future shit. We spend most of the movie with Cecilia Cass, played by Elizabeth Moss. We slowly find out that she has been in an abusive relationship by Adrian Griffin, a top scientist in the field of optics. As you can tell from the trailer, she is being stalked, tortured, and gaslighted by something or someone that cannot be seen. Cecilia is smart, she figures shit out quick, but the problem is nobody believes her, and she has to struggle to keep her from going insane, and that is all of the plot I will tell you. First of all, the script for this is faithful in that it is once again exploring the dark side of the H.G. Wells' Invisible Man, this time through the eyes of the victim, his wife. Why this works is first off, this screenplay is flawless. It doesn't waste any time getting right into it, doesn't tell you everything right away, has a few twists that don't feel forced, and a few that might even genuinely surprise you. It's also telling you a different story than the one you think you know, and that's what I like about it. It turns things on its ear, but in a clever way. The third act is action heavy, and it feels like a reward because the build up to get to it is earned. Also, you may think things are wrapping up, but then it kicks into a third gear and keeps on going. The cast is great, and Elizabeth Moss as Cecilia is absolutely crushing it. Just like Jaws, where the barrels represent the shark coming back. In this one, Celia's reactions represent what you cannot see. I would honestly put her as Oscar material, but horror movies never get those, so whatever. Oh, what the fuck ever! But what I'm telling you is that she is not your typical final girl material either. Moss has to do an incredible amount of heavy lifting in this movie, and she delivers. She's mostly the voice of the audience, but then there were some times where I thought, oh yeah, why didn't I think of that? I mean, wrap your head around the what would you do if you were being stalked by someone you know is invisible and nobody believed you. I had friends, both male and female, that had been in similar situations and it's terrifying in any regard. Not being stalked by invisible people, but being gaslighted and being in abusive relationships. The Invisible Man doesn't try to scare her. He does abusive shit that will fuck up a day-to-day -day situations that will make people hate her even more by taking things and hiding them. The rest of the cast is good too, but Moss is the focus of this one. There are a few surprisingly well-placed jump scares in this movie as well. Not the kind induced by artificial bullshit jump scare noises, <laughs> but actual natural scares, such as something falling and hitting the floor. The music score is very impressive too. I was not expecting that from a Blumhouse movie. Another horror movie trope they abandon is there is no, no sequel baiting. baiting. The movie actually has an ending, and that's all I will tell you. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! And unless you're a film nerd like me, yes, you can get up and leave once the credits roll. No Marvel bullshit this time. The movie captures the mood and the tone of the 1936 film without having to directly copy it in any way. And I would have to say that this one is an example of what you can do with a horror film when you actually give a shit. I'd say the only downside to this movie were a couple of minor plot holes. So I'm giving this one a four out of five cheese curds. Provolone. Actually, scrap that. The script, the acting, the music, the action, and the execution of this movie were so good that I can honestly overlook the minor plot holes. You could say this movie's so good that it makes those plot holes seem rather invisible. <laughs> so actually I'm giving this a 5 out of 5 cheese curds. Smoked Gouda. I don't say! See what I did there? Subverted your expectations. Turned it on its ear. If I was a teacher in a classroom full of horror movie makers and this movie was a term paper, I would tape this one to the blackboard and say, see, this is what you get when you give a shit. This is the right way to do a proper fucking remake. Okay, The Grudge 2020, I'm talking to you, bitch. So I hope you get off your ass and go see The Invisible Man, and please don't spoil it for anyone. I guarantee that you'll have an almost as much fun talking about it as I did writing this review. You may not agree with my assessment. You may have even have some questions about the ending. But either way, you'll still have fun with the concepts. That being said, I'm hoping this one makes all of the monies this weekend, so the Blumhouse can finally stop saying, From the producers of Get Out, Us, and Halloween, and say, from the producers of The Invisible Man. Instead, because if Universal wants to treat its classics as well as this one, hell yeah, sign me up. More of this, please, in less dark universe. This is Mr. E.R. Bradsaw of Maple Court, Black Lion Road, Southeast 5. 
He cannot be seen. Now, I'm going to ask him to stand up. Mr. Bradsaw, will you stand up, please? <laughs> this demonstrates the value of not being seen. <laughs>